All right, folks, welcome to EMS Grand Rounds. Um, I'm here with Alex. We're going to talk about uh, trauma in pregnancy today. Again, please visit emsgrandrounds.com and visit there for our schedule of ongoing EMS Grand Rounds sessions. Uh, and don't forget, this has been approved for Utah CME credit with Dr. Talak. Uh, when this is published, right below this video is going to be a description for a quiz. Complete that quiz, put in your email address, and we'll get that certificate emailed out to you. And uh, with that, I'll kick it over to Alex. Thank you. All right, my name is Alex Rogerson. I'm a flight paramedic for Air Med. Uh, I've also been a firefighter for around 11 years for a local fire agency in Utah. And today we're gonna to talk about trauma and pregnancy. Uh, from what I can remember, I didn't really get a very good basis on what to do with the gravid trauma patient. So a couple of things that we're not gonna talk about today is emergency cesarean section. It just doesn't make sense, the research doesn't support it. We're not gonna talk about tocolytics, we're not gonna talk about uh, stopping anything. This is merely and purely an EMS uh, specific trauma in pregnancy PowerPoint. So uh, it's gonna be pretty uh, straightforward. It'll be really, uh, position for EMS. So we're just gonna get right started in it. This is trauma and pregnancy and an EMS approach to uh, the gravid woman. So some objectives we're gonna cover in this PowerPoint and this presentation today is the recognition of a trauma patient. So who's, who's pregnant, who's not, when do we worry about them, when are we not so worried about them? But we're gonna go from there. Uh, some scene considerations in pregnancy some things that you're gonna to wanna to look for. When you say, oh, I have a pregnant patient or there is a pregnant patient on scene in a car accident, whatever, these are some things you're gonna to wanna to look at as far as BSI, is my scene safe or is my scene evolving kind of stuff. So we're gonna go through the specific anatomy and physiology in pregnancy. Some pretty heavy stuff changes in pregnancy. It's actually very, very hard and very complicated. Um, so we're gonna go through just some basic stuff for EMS and the evaluation of a maternal trauma patient. So a lot of stuff that we weren't given in paramedic school, at least I wasn't, was, hey, you have a pregnant patient. How do you know what's going on? What are some questions to ask? And I've kind of pieced some stuff together and I've also read a lot of literature on better questions to ask and things to get at. And causes of fetal and maternal trauma and mortality. So these are two different things. We can have fetal mortality and we can have maternal mortality. Obviously, maternal trauma and mortality can lead uh, or does lead or will lead to fetal mortality if not corrected. So, and then one of, second to last, preventing maternal decompensation and injury to the fetus. This is very important. And this is where we're going to come in most times. And then number eight, maternal arrest. What happens if your patient who is pregnant is in arrest? All right, so some pregnancy facts. In women ages 15 to 44 years old, around 140 per 1,000 are pregnant. About 4 million women were pregnant last year in the United States. And as population grows, the likelihood that you will care for a pregnant woman grows with that. So trauma occurs in five to 20% of all pregnancy. And this is a statistic that was shocking to me. And it, it's a wide range with a huge gray area. On the low range, it's like major trauma. She rolls her car, is ejected, gunshot wound, stab wound, the big, bad, and uglies that show up to a level one trauma center. And then there's this big gray area of everything in between and all the way down to just slip and falls in the bathroom, just, you know, a uh, trip, just broken bones that have nothing to do with the pregnancy. Uh, she breaks her arm, she you know, gets a, a foot fracture. So there's a lot, of, a lot of gray area in between, but what we're gonna focus on is the big, bad, and ugly that shows up to a level one trauma center or level two trauma centers or even rural clinics and need evaluation. Um, so and specifically, we're gonna go through uh, the EMS involvement in that, in that chain of care. So trauma rates have fallen steadily since 1990. And the reason for that is better education, better maternal care, and better fetal care. So there's a lot of education and practitioners out there that when a woman is pregnant, a lot of women have access to uh, 
you know, the, the maternal care side and fetal care side. So we're getting better as a society, but this is still a big problem. Trauma is the leading cause of maternal death, and that goes without saying, but the incidence of trauma increases along with the pregnancy. This seems very obvious that this would be the case. However, where it's broken out is important for our evaluation. So obviously, as the uterus becomes more of its own organ outside of the body, external to the pelvis, pregnancy trauma goes up. So in the first trimester, only 8% of, of pregnancy trauma happened in the first trimester. And in the second trimester, it goes up to 40. And in the fifth, it goes to 50, or in the third, it goes up into 52%. So as she becomes more pregnant and as that uterus becomes more of an external structure, the likelihood of trauma goes up. So motor vehicle crashes are the leading cause of deaths related to maternal trauma. So pregnant women drive, there's a lot of car accidents in the United States, and you're likely to see a pregnant woman in a motor vehicle accident. And penetrating injury is the leading cause of fetal mortality. So, and we're gonna go through why each of these are why they are and where they are. So how do we define pregnancy? To be able to say we have a pregnant patient, we're going to be able to define pregnancy. And a lot of people know this. Those of you that don't, that's okay. It's not a stork, but we're gonna go through a mature ovum has been expelled by the follicle. So an ovum comes out of the ovary and begins traveling down the fallopian tube. The ovum is fertilized and turned into a zygote. So as it's fertilized in the fallopian tube, it continues to move down the fallopian tube and then the zygote matures into a pre-embryo. That pre-embryo implants into the uterine wall and that is when you are technically defined as pregnant. So she's pregnant when she has a implanted pre-embryo into the uterine wall and that's when they start growing a placenta and an amniotic sac begins to form. So that implantation is where they're pregnant. So who's pregnant? So Lena Medina, a Peruvian girl from the Andean village of Ticarapo, made medical history when she gave birth to a boy by cesarean section in May 1939 at the age of five. So we can all pretty much assume kind of where that comes from. So this could possibly be a sexual trauma, but this is the youngest documented person that has ever given birth. So what about on the other end of the spectrum? Don Brooke gave birth to a son by cesarean section on August 20th, 1997 at the age of 59. So what's different about her is that she conceived naturally. So she is the oldest natural conception that has ever taken place. So on the other hand, uh, Miss Lohan from, uh, she is from India. She received a, uh, in vitro fertilization and gave birth to a daughter at the age of 70. And she nearly died due to complications, as we can all imagine. Um, however, she isn't the oldest one that's given birth because her age is unconfirmed. So, but for what we're talking about in EMS, our usual reproductive age is 15 to 44. So we have a wide span. We've had five years old, we've had 70 years old. So really what we're assuming is that if she's got a baby bump, she's pregnant. Everyone can be pregnant. However, we're gonna go through 15 to 44 as our big you know, margin of people that are, are gals that are gonna be most likely pregnant. So in one study, 3% of trauma patients admitted to a trauma center were pregnant. Of those 3%, 11% of those pregnancies were incidental. That means they didn't know they were pregnant. So they get a pink top tube, they go down, she's pregnant. Congratulations in the trauma center, you're pregnant. Uh, or they go through and do an ultrasound. They do an abdominal fast and they find out that she is pregnant. That's really important for imaging and things like that. You don't wanna put a pregnant gal in an abdominal CT. But for us EMS, we're just gonna say that she is pregnant until proven otherwise if she's within childbearing years. And also, we're going to attenuate our care based on that. So we're going to be, we're going to do stuff differently depending on how pregnant she is. And we're going to do stuff differently depending on not how pregnant she is. So when do you have two patients? In EMS, when do you have two patients? When are you concerned? 
So somewhere between the sixth and the 20th week of pregnancy, the uterus becomes a, a larger, more external organ. This increases the incidence of trauma. Remember that as we go through the trimesters, trauma increases, or the likelihood at least. So when the uterus starts peaking above the pubic bone is about 12 weeks. But at 12 weeks, we aren't really concerned very much about that if she is or isn't pregnant. It's a concern, it's a consideration, it's part of our assessment. However, it doesn't, it's not going to be a huge dictator of how we provide care. This changes though when she's got a fundal height uh, with, at the umbilicus, which is about 20 weeks. This is when she starts to have problems if we don't recognize things and change things and change our approach and strategy. So in EMS, we've become concerned about maternal and fetal complication as soon as we find out our patient is pregnant. If she is in within childbearing age, she is considered pregnant until proven otherwise, but obviously we're gonna see how pregnant she is. So if you can't ask a trauma patient if they're unconscious or if they don't know or if you don't speak the language that they speak, this is an easy way to find out. You'll notice that the 20 week fundal height where you can palpate the top of the uterus, the fundus, that at 20 weeks, it's about navel line. And every centimeter above that, which is about a finger, like a pinky, if you have extra large fingers, it might be two centimeters, but about a pinky height is about a centimeter. So every, you can count from the navel up and find out just about how pregnant she is. However, you're gonna spend a lot of time doing that and wasting time when we could just do things considering that she's pregnant. But this just gives us an idea of how pregnant is she? Now, if you're actively palpating a fundus on a trauma patient who needs IVs or C-spine or you know, airway control, then we're kind of missing the boat, but this will give us a good idea of where she's at. All right, so let's go through and wonder maternal anatomy and why it's important. So there's chemodynamic changes, changes within the cardiovascular system and in the blood itself. So she gets a 35 to 40% total blood volume increase throughout the pregnancy. So at 40 weeks, she's had approximately 35 to 40% of a total blood volume increase. So where does it go? We'll, a we'll answer that in a minute. So to deal with that, she has increased cardiac output. Her heart has to work harder. And plasma increases first at around five to seven weeks, followed by a 25% increase in red blood cells at 27 to 33 weeks. So in the initial phases of pregnancy, at five to seven weeks, plasma increases fast. Plasma is e easy to make. Our bones don't have to make red blood cells for that plasma yet, plasma is fast. So as we make more plasma, she just becomes more diluted. So her oxygen carrying capability is the same as far as she has the same amount of red blood cells initially, but they get further apart. So that's, gonna, that's going to affect the way we oxygenate her and the way we look at her oxygen saturations and also you know, just her cardiovascular health in general. So a 2,3 DPG, that's a, that's a big word. Those of you that haven't heard of it yet, don't be frightened by a, a really big word. This is something that, that was, I learned just recently as far as a flight paramedic certification. So 2,3 DPG, is the crowbar. Think about it like the crowbar that pops oxygen off of the uh, heme protein that carries oxygen. So on your hemoglobin, you have oxygen bound to it. This, this gets it off. This is the pry bar that pops oxygen off of the erythrocyte. So 2,3 DPG concentration increases and this decreases the affinity of the mother's RBCs to oxygen, causing a right shift in the oxyhemoglobin dissociative curve. This is a lot of big stuff, but what this means is she deoxygenates quickly. So if you have a pregnant patient versus a non-pregnant patient, the pregnant patient will deoxygenate much, much faster, and you'll see precipitously falling sat oxygen saturations in your SpO2 probe. So this is, this is bad and good. It's good because she can deliver oxygen to the cells readily. She can deliver them fast and she can deliver a lot of oxygen to the cells. However, this is bad being that no, it, it doesn't choose which cell it gives it to. It just gives it to any cell that it passes by. So we have to keep her oxygenated. So 
we're going to go through how to oxygenate a pregnant woman and kind of some of those things that go along with that. So she has a systemic decrease in blood pressure. This is because she gets a 35 to 40 percent increase of blood volume. So she becomes vasodilated and arteriodilated. It, we have to have somewhere to put all of this new fluid volume that she gets. So that's why also there's an increased cardiac output. So to maintain her blood pressure in these vasodilated states, we need to increase our stroke volume and our heart rate to be able to uh, combat hypotension. So she has a decreased colloid oncotic pressure. So this is how leaky she becomes as far as the veins and arteries go. We all know that pregnant women get edema in their lower extremities. This is because of the decreased colloid oncotic pressure or COP. Notably albumin. Albumin is the protein that kind of is one of the proteins that kind of helps us uh, keep our vessels closed and kind of fill the leaks in the pipe, so to speak. So as we decrease that by making more plasma, we get or she gets uh, more edemis, uh, more edema everywhere, especially in her lower extremities. And she can also get pulmonary edema, and they are very, very susceptible to pulmonary edema. So, and one of the last things, but nonetheless important, is positional hypotension. If you roll a very gravid woman onto her back, you will start to see her blood pressure fall. And this is because of pressure on the inferior vena cava through a big fundus. The, her uterus has a baby inside of it, and depending on where she is in pregnancy, usually over that 20 week, uh, 12 to 20 week period is when we're gonna start to consider that she's gonna have positional hypotension if you roll her on her back. So we're gonna teach you how to combat that as well. So some hemodynamic parameters. So heart rate. In the non-pregnant versus the pregnant. So in the non-pregnant, an average of 71 beats a minute, and in the pregnant, an average of 83 beats per minute. We went through this and why that happens. It's the increased blood fluid volume and venodilation and arteriodilation. So she needs to jack up her heart rate a little bit to be able to combat hypertension. So her mean arterial blood pressure as goes from 86.5 to 90.3, so that's not a huge change because hopefully she's hemodynamically stable. She's not hypotensive, she's not hypertensive. Those are both problems. But her cardiac output is goes from 4.3 to 6.2. It's massive jump. So that's because she's increased heart rate and increased blood fluid volume. So she's trying to pump a lot of blood really fast to combat hypertension. So her systemic vascular resistance, this, is, this goes down quite a bit. So because, we're arteri because she's arteriodilating and venodilating, we go from 1,520 dynes per, se per second per centimeter squared to 1,210. And if you ask me what a dyne per second per centimeter squared is, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to, all I know is it goes down. <laughs> so her left ventricular systolic work index, this is how hard the left ventricle is working, the powerhouse of the heart that perfuses the rest of our body this is how hard it's working. And it's not a huge change, but the left ventricle does work harder, just based on the fact that heart rate goes up and stroke volume goes up. So venous pressure stays ab about the same, but it does drop a little bit. And the venous pressure deals with arterial pressure, and hopefully we're not hypotensive, hopefully we're not hypertensive, so we want that to stay the same. So the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure actually increases. So this is along with a, colloid, a decreased colloid oncotic pressure, making her more edemous as, as well, she gets an increased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which is why they start to be at risk for pulmonary edema. So, and as we said, the colloid onco oncotic pressure drops. So, moving on, pulmonary. The pulmonary changes in the pregnant patient is that one is the diaphragm rises about four centimeters in the chest. This is to make way for all the organs that were right above the uterus that are now being displaced. So her diaphragm will rise. This causes a problem because that rise is caused by pressure in her abdominal cavity. So chest diameter to compensate for that increases two centimeters. So she gets a big barrel chest and she has a 20% drop in functional reserve capacity. That's the big deep breath that you can take. 
she can't do that. She's got a big uterus pushing up all of her internal organs into her chest cavity, and so her diaphragm has to come up along with that. So we also have a 20% increase in O2 demand. Remember the, the 2,3-DPG is popping oxygen off of heme molecules fast. So we need to be able to replenish that. And it's, she's also feeding a higher heart rate. She's also feeding a higher respiratory rate. She's also feeding a kid. So her oxygen demand will increase 20%. So she'll have a 15% increase in minute ventilation. So not only does she, is she not able to breathe deeply or expand her chest as much as she would normally, but now she has to compensate for that by breathing faster. So she'll, her respiratory rate will increase considerably. So there's some specific airway complications due to weight gain, body habitus, and GERD. And body habitus is how our body is positioned. So as a woman becomes more and more pregnant, her body habitus changes. How we look at her and how she's shaped and how she, we treat her changes. So some specific airway complications we're going to go through um, in our trauma patients as far as how to deal with specific airway concerns. At the paramedic level, if you can intubate, these are different patients. You're going to expect a difficult airway, and we'll go through that again. If you are a basic good airway adjuncts and basic airway control, well, all pregnant women get oxygen right off the bat. The, for the short transport times that we're gonna have in the valley here, it, you're not gonna hurt them big by putting them on 15 liters by non breather. If you have an, a two hour transport, three hour transport, four hour transport, then that does change, but talk to your medical control physician about this stuff. What, does, what did they want you to do? But for, for us, a good rule of thumb is put them on oxygen. And that is because they have rapid falls in their arterial oxygen uh, during apnea or obstruction due to the 2,3-DPG and their body habitus. So they obstruct their airway really easy. So the, G, the gastrointestinal and gastrourological uh, this is a big part too. This affects us with our airway control. GI motility slows. That means they get intestinal congestion. They can get constipated. They can get ups, uh, upset stomachs. They can have abdominal pain. They can have uh, gastric emptying problems. So that slows. How fast they empty their stomach slows. And a good rule of thumb is if they've had an oral intake within 24 hours, assume they have a full stomach. Now, I don't know many pregnant women that can make it six hours without eating, much less 24. So right off the bat, if you have a pregnant trauma patient who can't tell you the last time that they ate, we're just gonna assume that they have a full belly. And we're going to treat, you know, to prevent vomiting. We're gonna prevent airway obstruction. We're going to have suction ready. This is about prevention and preparation. So they have an increased urine production. <laughs> and along with that, and they get a decreased urine storage space. So this is one of, one of the big jokes. Not only do they have to pee more, but they have less place to put it. So it's a cruel, uh, but it's a fact. So 70% of women complain of nausea and 40% 40 ex 40 experience vomiting. So that's a big thing for us to take into consideration that not only with morning sickness, but with the delayed GI motility and the delayed gastric emptying, we want to take that into consideration. So uh, there has been a lot of research on preferred anti-nausea medications. So the question is stated, is there a preferred anti-nausea medication? So versus Phenergrin versus Zofran. There's, there's some studies out and you may have seen some legal literature about Zofran and fetal birth defects and things like that. And what, where that stemmed from was a long-term everyday use of Zofran that there may be a a correlation to fetal uh, birth defect and, but those are women that are taking many, 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 many doses of Zofran throughout their entire pregnancy. For us in the EMS field, Zofran is safe and Phenergrin is safe. Phenergrin, however, you want to make sure that you have a patent IV as with Phenergrin administration. So the biggest things with Phenergrin is extravasation and necrosis to the tissue and not only that, but also be burning, for lack of a better term, burning the inside of the vein with a very caustic medication. So make sure you dilute Zofran. 
and their IVs should be below their ACs if they are pregnant, and, but if you need big IVs, then above the uterus, above where if her hands were to the side, get big IVs, but remember that if she's gonna be pushing out a kid, she's going to have her arms kinked and AC IVs just won't work. So hand, forearms, and above the AC is a really good way to go. But as far as anti-nausea meds, for our emergency application, give her something that will work. And Zofran is one of the safer drugs to use, but follow your protocols. Ask your own medical control physician what they want you to use. But in either of these, those are, those are both just fine. So, all right. Musculoskeletal. There's a widening of the pelvis. Obviously, we're making a birth can canal for a child. So she has to have a widened out pelvis with a birth canal. So she'll get those, for lack of a better term, mother hips. And that's a joke, but it happens. And this actually causes some pretty big changes in her lower anatomy. So to, to compensate for that big gravid fundus that she has hanging out in front of her, she has to lean back. She has to change her center of gravity. So she leans back and and arches her back toward her posterior, which gives her lumbar lordosis. So she's leaned back, her hips are widened out, she has hip, leg, and back pain, and her postural stability goes down. So think about changing just about everything that you've learned to walk with your entire life in nine months, and it getting worse and worse and worse. And this leads to an increased fall risk, in fact, uh, one study showed that pregnant women experience ground level fall at nearly the same rate as women over 70. So you're going to go on some fall patients that are pregnant and you're going to have to be able to ask some questions and evaluate that. So let's get into trauma and pregnancy. So fetal death can occur at any gestational age and usually results from fetal hypoxia. Secondarily, a drop in maternal blood pressure of 20% results in fetal hypoxia acidosis and compromise if left untreated. So that seems obvious. That seems really obvious to the EMS provider. Well, of course it does. Bad, low blood pressure is bad. Well, especially in pregnant gals, because not only are they at risk of hypotension, but the fetus is risk, at risk of hypotension. They're at risk for hypoxia, so is the fetus. And knowing about what we know about their anatomy and kind of what's going on with the cardiovascular system, loss in blood pressure is bad especially they have a lot of confounding factors that compound against her. So, abdominal pain. How many of you have been on an abdominal pain patient who's pregnant? And you're trying to figure out, is this pregnancy cause? Is this something else? Does she have a gallbladder problem? Does she, is she constipated? Is this GI upset? Did she eat something bad? What's going on? Well, Abdominal pain, we know how to assess abdominal pain in uh, a guy. We know how to ass assess abdominal pain in a non-pregnant woman. But in a pregnancy, this is, might be a confounding factor, but we can get through it. So abdominal pain can be a normal part of pregnancy and can be a natural part of adaptation to a growing fetus. After trauma, however, there are questions that need to be asked. So this is a woman who you asked, hey, have you fallen recently? Have you been in a car accident? In the last two, tell me about your last week. Anything big, bad, and ugly happened? Have you fallen down the stairs? Have you been hit? Have you been kicked? If she's UFC fighting while pregnant, that's probably not a good idea to do. But you need to ask these questions. Have you been hurt in the last week, two weeks? If she's like, oh yeah, I took a big fall down the stairs yesterday and has abdominal pain, she's already bought a ticket to the hospital in my opinion. If she wants to go POV, great. But I suggest she go see an OB. So how far along is she in weeks? So this is, this is different because this is how exposed the, the fundus is and also how tall the uterus is so that it changes. Remember that in our second and third trimester pregnancies, trauma and risk of trauma goes up exponentially from the first trimester. So if she's eight weeks pregnant, we're gonna be more concerned about her arms, her legs. What is her chief complaint? So, does she have severe or persistent pain? This is an in indicator to have her tell you where it is. Is she spotting or bleeding with or without pain? And obviously we probably all know where that's going. And we're gonna go through that in a minute. Does she have fever? Does she have chills? So this can be an infection, this could be sepsis. Pregnant women can have sickness that isn't 
involved with their pregnancy or can be hampered by their pregnancy or can be caused from a problem during pregnancy. So we need to ask this. So a vaginal discharge. So if she has an increased vas vaginal discharge, a change in vaginal discharge, this could be signs of ruptured membranes. This could be signs of bleeding internally. So this is something that we'll need to ask. So lightheadedness, is she more lightheaded than normal? Is, can she stand up? Does she have positional hypotension? Does, can she get off the couch? You know, this is where orthostatics comes in and we take her blood pressure laying down and we take it if she tries to move to our stretcher. If she has a big change in that, we need to change our treatment plan. So let's go through some specific stuff. So let's go through blunt trauma. This is a seat belt. This is a seat belt incorrectly worn. Uh, ladies out there, please don't wear a seat belt over your fundus when you get pregnant or if you are pregnant. Please wear it low over your hips where it's supposed to be. Uh, dudes, be watching out for this. Be watching for your girlfriends or your wives, you know, and your patients. Be watching out for how they're wearing their seatbelt. And obviously this is a late sign. We wouldn't see this bruising in the first 15, 20, 30 minutes. And if you do, this is, that's very bad. But this appears later. So you have to ask them if you can where they wear their seatbelt. So automobile accidents are the most common. So 12.6 accidents per 1,000 pregnant women. So how many car accidents do we go on in our city? Well, we hopefully go on all of the car accidents in our city that we're dispatched to. So if you have a pregnant woman, this is, this, these are bad for her. There's a lot of stuff stacked up against her inside of a car, and especially in a high-speed or a, a complicated motor vehicle accident. So automobiles are the leading cause of death to the mother. So maternal death is... Uh, this is by far above and beyond is caused by vehicular trauma in car accidents or being hit or, you know, crossing a roadway, whatever. So improperly worn seat belts are a big, a big problem with that. And we want to evaluate for placental abruption, uterine rupture, preterm labor, and direct fetal injury. And we're going to go through how to do that. So placental abruption. Placental abruption is awful. This is a huge... This is a huge problem that, that can happen and be very, very, you know, under the radar. It can be really obvious. It can be both ways. So this is something we really have to, we have to evaluate for. So in the early stages of placental abruption, there may be no symptoms. She may have no pain, no bleeding. She may have gotten some trauma. Uh, she may have been wearing a seatbelt wrong, gotten an airbag or uh, not been restrained and hit the steering wheel with her seat or with her fundus on the steering wheel. So we just want to make sure that we're doing a good assessment of the abdomen after we get the ABCs of her done. So sudden onset of, con of abdominal pain, this is bad. Sudden onset, it's like, at first I was good, now I'm not, there's a lot of pain. This is something obviously that we would be concerned about with anyone. But contractions that don't stop and may follow one after another so rapidly as they seem to be continuous. So this, is, this can be preterm labor. It can irritate the uterus. You can, uh, you can abrupt the placenta enough that the body tries to expel the child. So this is something that we have to, we have to really take into consideration. If she has contractions of any kind, I say she's bought a ticket in my ambulance. If she hasn't, if she's has constant contractions, hey, she's bought a ticket in my ambulance again. So pain in the uterus, obviously this is a no-brainer. If she has pain in the uterus, she needs to go in and get checked. Tenderness in the abdomen, again, this is a no-brainer and, and it's obvious. So vaginal bleeding may be present. So it may be present. It may not be present. It depends on where her placenta is attached, where it's abrupted, how high, how long it's been, how bad it is, you know, there's a lot of factors to take into place on. Yes, you will see or won't see vaginal bleeding. There's no finite conclusion on where that's going to be. Everyone's different. So if she has, if the uterus is disproportionately enlarged in one area or another, or she's stacking blood and it's getting way bigger, if she's 20 weeks pregnant and looks like she's eight months, you know, that's a big problem. That's blood in the abdomen or something, something awful has happened. So if she's, if she's pallor, if she's got that ashen look, then she's bleeding. 
So non-reassuring fetal status, so decreased fetal movement and worrisome fetal heart rate. So if, you're t if you have a pregnant trauma patient who is really hurt and you're listening for fetal heart tones, you may be missing the boat. If you know how to listen to fetal heart tones, that's awesome for you. I don't, that's not really a big concern. I figure if mom can say, yes, the, the kid has or has not moved, this is normal or abnormal. So this is a very subjective thing because everybody's different, every baby is different. So you wanna ask mom, hey, have, has the baby moved? Has the baby kicked? Is this normal or abnormal? And she'll tell you. And based on her assessment, since she knows her pregnancy and she knows herself much better than you and I ever will, we'll go based on her subjective assessment and the answers to her questions. So this is, a, this is an abrupted, uh, this is an abrupt show. So we've got a full abruption and it's low. We've got a partial abruption and it's high. So the difference between bleeding and not bleeding doesn't mean they do or do not have a placental abrupt show. So if she has pain in her uterus, again, we're going to rehash that pain in her uterus, pain in her abdomen. If she has a uh, weird bumps in the top of her fundus or anywhere in her fundus, if she has a larger than what would seem to be uterus, then we obviously want to be concerned about this. So this directly affects the fetus and can directly affect mom. They can both bleed really heavily from this. It can kill the kid and it can kill mom. Now, how we diagnose that? Well, they have to go to a hospital. They go to a hospital and they get an ultrasound. If the ultrasound, they can see the placental, the placental lining and see if they're healthy. That's great, but we really can't assess that firsthand. We can have that be a differential diagnosis. We can have that be a consideration, but really she's bought a ride in the ambulance. But this is the difference between concealed and visible bleeding and placental uh, abruptio. So uterine rupture. Obviously this is a catastrophic event. This is big trauma and a uterus is actually very strong. It's just a big muscle. It's got a lot of linings to it. And so to, ru to rupture a uterus is actually very hard, but as it gets bigger and as it gets thinner, it's easier and easier to rupture. Now, if the integrity of the myometrial wall is broken, this is really bad. In a complete or in, in an incomplete rupture, the peritoneum is still intact. So that means that the little bag that holds the uterus is intact. The uterus can be, can have a penetrating injury or a blunt force trauma where it tears, but nothing spilling out of it. It's kind of contained inside of its own perineal sac. So with a complete rupture, however, the contents of the uterus will spill into the peritoneal cavity. So you'll have uh, fetal parts, you will have amniotic fluid spilling out into the abdominal cavity, which is obviously very, very, very bad. So this will be mild to moderate referred pain to the scapula. So the same nerves in the dermatomes that innervate her uterus also innervate back up into her scapula. She'll get some pain up in there. So look for that referred pain. So chest pain. So chest pain from diaphragmatic irritation. So she will have like this low substernal, uh, almost diaphragmatic and almost cardiac presenting chest pain because Blood is a super, super irritant to the body. Outside of the vessels, it's irritating. And also amniotic fluid, that's not good to have floating around. And a fetus, obviously, floating around is not good. So all of these things can cause chest pain and diaphragmatic irritation and also fetal distress. So a lot of kicking, no kicking, uh, decreased fetal heart tones. These are, these are bad things and some of us have the ability to monitor that, some of us don't. For those of us that don't, obviously, again, this is a subjective assessment from the mom, if you can do so. So then there's also the, the big bad and ugly of easily palpable or directly exposed fetal parts. If she has a communicating injury from the outside to the inside of her uterus, if she has an impaled object and you have an ar or a big hole in her abdomen, and uterus and there's an arm hanging out of it, obviously this is a huge problem. And do your best to keep everything intact. Don't try to put it back in. 
Don't try to move it around. Just cover it with uh, something wet, like an abdominal combine with sterile water, and transport rapidly to the hospital. That's about all we can do in EMS. We aren't going to deliver the kid. We aren't going to make incisions. We aren't going to put back in. This is just roll fast. Treat with diesel fuel. So this is a uterine rupture. This is the myometrial wall inside, and that uterine rupture is obviously very, very long and very bad, and it's very bloody, and it's shrunk down in size. So it's, this is not looking good. So penetrating trauma. Let's go through penetrating trauma. So penetrating trauma, as we said, is more deadly to the fetus. This is a fetal gunshot wound. So, however, this is more deadly for the fetus, it's penetrating trauma in a pregnant woman is more survivable for the pregnant woman. And if you think about it, the answer is pretty obvious. She's growing a bulletproof shield over her abdomen. And it's not bulletproof as in like Iron Man or you know Kevlar, but it's somewhere, it's just a big bag of fluid and tissue that absorbs impact from her getting hit. So this is, as we said, fetal mortality, huge in penetrating trauma, gunshot wounds, stabbings, uh, falls with penetration, automobile accidents with penetrating trauma to the abdomen, it's more likely that the fetal is, uh, the fetus is going to die. It's becoming more common. Unfortunately, we are getting a more violent society. And our taboo boundaries are starting to go away. Yeah, of course, none of us would shoot a pregnant woman. I hope. If you would, then please get help. But none of us would shoot a pregnant woman. That's not to say that pregnant women don't get shot, either by accident or intentionally by spouses, by other people, by gang members, gang-affiliated, drug-affiliated problems. These can all have possibility that, the, that she's going to get shot. So primarily gunshot wound. That's the primary penetrating trauma in women. Women don't usually work on construction sites where they're going to fall and impale themselves on rebar. Women don't get in accidents usually in cars that have penetrating trauma. That's actually very rare. It's more the blunt force trauma with cars. But gunshot wound is the leading cause of fetal trauma. And stabbing assault is obviously a close second to that. So pregnancy actually increases survivability, as we said, to the mother compared to the non-pregnant. So gunshot wounds are more dangerous to the fetus due to the cavitation. We think about if you fill a, a milk jug full of water and you shoot it, it will look very, very different as if you filled a milk jug with nothing, just air, and shot it. So that milk jug full of water is going to explode. It's, there's a lot of cavitation, water is very dense, and that bullet traveling through it will cause a lot of damage. However, the bullet won't go as far, hopefully. So uh, stab wounds tend to have a better prognosis, actually for both the fetus and the mother. So stab wounds, unless it's really, 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 really bad, and it goes through the fetus and severs an umbilical cord, or uh, goes through the placenta, things like that, you know, it, it can be survivable. Um, the mom is actually going to survive better, obviously, because again, she has a shield in front of her. So a study of 321 pregnant trauma patients showed that 9% had tra penetrating trauma. 73% of those were gunshot wounds. So the risk of maternal death was not significantly higher with penetrating trauma than with blunt trauma. 7% versus 2%. However, fetal mortality was significantly higher, 75% versus 10% with penetrating trauma. So, lo and behold, mom, mom comes away from that better than the kid. The kid is more often hurt with penetrating trauma. So, sexual and domestic abuse. This happens in pregnant females, uh, not only from uh, male partners, but also women in prison, women in jail. They can be sexually abused. They can be uh, physically assaulted. These are things that, that you will roll on if you have a jail in your area. You're going to take care of a pregnant woman. And pregnant women go to jail. So also at home, there, there are people who will hit their pregnant wife. So domestic and intimate partner violence actually increases during pregnancy. 
10 to 30 percent. That's staggering. I didn't think it was going to be that high when I did the research on it. However, 10 to 30 percent higher likelihood. And if you think about it, pregnancy is high stress. She changes. She has a lot of hormonal changes. He changes. He has a financial obligation, a housing obligation. There can be a lot of factors that roll into pregnancy trauma. So it's more common in young mothers, teens to 25 years of age. It's way more common. Obviously, again, stress. Do we tell my parents? Do you tell your parents? Uh, where do we get fetal care? How do we get maternal care? Do I take folic acid? Do I not? Do I, there's a lot of stress that rolls into it and they can end up beating each other up. The abdomen is the most common target. 64% of the time, the abdomen is the most common target. And that astounded me also. I didn't think it was that prevalent. But 5% of these domestic and intimate partner violence cases, 5% results in fetal death. So a study in Ontario revealed 6.6% of pregnant women who presented to the emergency department reported domestic violence. That's almost one in 10. So if you go on 10 pregnant women, you're likely to see one that is actually getting abused at home. So these are maybe not questions you need to ask. You would almost treat these as you would a child abuse case where you wouldn't confront anybody directly, but you would look for things on scene, some signs and symptoms of that and alert the hospital, the receiving hospital. It's not your job to prosecute, nor is it your job to enforce the law. Keep yourself safe. The best thing that you can do is keep a calm place for the mom to be and take care of mom. Get her out of the situation, whether she was the cause or the recipient of the abuse, it doesn't matter. You've got to transport her out of that situation one way or another. So burns and electrocution. These are actually very rare. This is a, this is a burn. This is actually an old burn and a woman who got pregnant from, you know, later on down the line. So uh, obviously you can see that the skin probably won't stretch very well in that. So, you know, but electrical current that travel traverses the amniotic fluid, which is an excellent source of, or an excellent conductor because it has salts in it, it has, you know, proteins in it. It conducts electricity really efficiently. It may lead to spontaneous abortion, fetal demise or fetal burns. And so, if any woman has been electrocuted, let's take them to the hospital. So pregnant women are rarely burned, but as firefighters in EMS, if we respond on a house fire, who's gonna be the first person that takes care of a burned woman? It's gonna be you and me. So thermal burns present similar to non-pregnant populations and they're managed likewise. So the risk of fluid loss and, you know, is huge with burns already and with a mom, you would do the same thing. You would fluid resuscitate to your standards or your protocols. A very common one is the Parkland burn formula, where you take their kilograms, their weight in kilograms, times it by their body surface area or their burn surface area. So your rule of nines and times that by two to four milliliters. And that's your Parkland burn formula. The first half of that, so when you come out with a, the formula, so you've got a so many kilogram person burns so many percent of their body times two to four milliliters. Let's say you come out with 6,200 mils. The first half of that, so 3,100 mils will be delivered in the first eight hours, not the first eight minutes, not the first eight seconds, but first eight hours. And then the second half of that will be delivered in, over the duration of the rest of the 24. So do a parkland burn formula the best you can. Transport thermal burns present very, very similar to non-pregnant patients. So treat it accordingly. So evaluate for smoke inhalation and thusly carboxyhemoglobin. So carboxyhemoglobin or CO, CO poisoning is really bad for the pregnant woman because not only does depending on the state of her pregnancy, depending on her general health, depending on how far along she is, she can have really fast precipitous drops in SpO2, but it will show on our SpO2 monitors of 100% or 98% or she'll be like, she's well oxygenated, this is great. But if she's been in a burning environment, if you have the ability to monitor carboxyhemoglobin, 
with like the rainbow sets from Mossimo or if your monitor or specific uh, monitor that you use has that ability, please do. And please do it to all patients if you can, but especially the pregos, that will help. So remember that CO, CO attaches to hemoglobin 200% better than oxygen. It's gonna knock off oxygen and stay there for a long time. And these are people that need hyper, uh, hyperbarics. So just keep that in mind. If you have a, a hyperbaric facility near you, it would be good to know how many people it can fit and if it can take pregnant people, you know, if it's for rehab or wound, wound healing stuff, or if it's like an emergency hyperbarics. So if the SPCO or the content of CO in the blood is above 50%, transport to a hyperbaric facility. So 15%. So that's an automatic transport to a hyperbaric facility. If it's above 5%, she needs evaluation and high flow oxygen. So let's talk about maternal traumatic arrest. So everything went bad. You have a gunshot wound or you have a car accident or an overdose or whatever it may be, you have an arrested pregnant woman. So the, the good thing about this is you start resuscitation according to standard ACLS guidelines. Don't attenuate doses. At this point, the pregnancy is secondary. We still take it into account, but the pregnancy is secondary. The things that we do change is the hand placement. So when you're doing compressions, the hand position for chest compressions may need to be slightly higher, two to three centimeters is all, on the sternum for the patients with advanced pregnancy or above 28 weeks. Remember 20 weeks is at the navel, so eight centimeters above the navel, that's 28 weeks, we may want to start putting our hand position higher. Just a little bit, not way high, not at the manubrium, not at the clavicle level, it's, it's just a little bit higher. But the, another big thing that we wanna do is to have really, really effective, good high performance CPR constantly. Stop for nothing, stop for no one as much as possible. Also, if you have the manpower to do so, manually displace the uterus to the left to, to minimize inferior vena cava compression. So you'll have somebody, so you'll have a supine pregnant woman, you're doing chest compressions because that's how we do chest compressions as supine. But if you have the manpower, and I suggest that you make or either get the manpower to do so, just manually pull that fundus off to the left side. You don't have to pull it all the way to the left. It's nothing traumatic. It's just you're trying to get that the weight of the uterus off of the inferior vena cava that's inside of there if you have to layer supine. Now, if you can, if you put her on a backboard or you can splint her off to the side and still do effective compressions, and that's the big take-home key, is still do effective compressions if you can at a 15 to 30 degree left lateral tilt, only if it's feasible. If it doesn't affect CPR to do this, great, go for it. This is going to do that left shift for you. But if you can't, like, do your best. Do good compressions, don't stop, and do your best. The patient's body will need to be supported on a firm surface to enable effective chest compressions anyway. So, thusly, if you've got a backboard, be able to roll them up. Even a small amount of tilt may be better than no tilt. So if all you can get is 5%, 10%, if you're sitting there with a protractor or whatever and you can measure their angle, that's awesome. If you have the time and the manpower to do so. But if you just get that fundus off of their inferior vena cava, that's the big thing. The angle of the tilt used needs to permit high quality chest compressions. Again, chest compressions. So if tilting on a firm surface and it's not pos possible to maintain manual left uterine displacement, Continue chest compressions with the patient supine. If all else fails, do good compressions. Just do your best. Standard defibrillation energy levels are recommended. Use the anterior, uh, anterior posterior electrode position preferably. So front back. If you can, use the front back. That way there's, you know, you're not gonna have a lot of chance of electricity going through the, the uterus anyway and defibrillation doses. Remember that mom is in big trouble so you know, defibrillate, CPR and defibrillate. Uh, with regard to AED use, there's no difference there, right? Half no. Placement, again, nope. 
So with AED use, there's no difference. Obviously, again, if you can do the AP pad placement, that's the best thing to do. Uh, but the AED doesn't have a checkbox that says, is the patient pregnant? It says, it monitors for the basic rhythms of cardiac arrest, and if they are arrested, then it evaluates that. Use an AED, and it's better to use an AED, and it's better to deliver energy because we want her to get ROSC. We want her to have a, a return of spontaneous circulation as soon as possible because that's gonna be better for her and the fetus. So really, we're trying to take care of the best incubator there is, and that's mom. So, all right. As far as airway goes, our paramedics out there, consider using a tracheal tube a half to a whole millimeter smaller than usual, as the trachea can be narrowed by edema and swelling. Remember our colloid oncotic pressure. Pregnant gals swell a lot, and they swell all over the place. So what we need to do is we need to plan for a difficult airway and use a tube that's just a little bit smaller than we would normally use on a non-pregnant female. So, and a good rule of thumb is a half to a whole size smaller. So 0.5 to one millimeter smaller. So superglottic airways, if you're using the King, the combi tube, the LMA, anything like that, superglottic airways are suitable alternatives in the priest hospital setting and may provide a more rapid means of oxygenation than potentially prolonged intubation attempts. Remember that as we intubate more and more, as we attempt to intubate more and more, our chances for success don't go down considerably from first to second to third pass. So if in your protocols you can place ET tubes, make sure that if you're going to shoot for an ET tube, make sure that you position well, that you have good airway angles, that she's pre-oxygenated, that you have all of those preparatory things in place so that you can intubate the first time. And if you have questions about it, if you can't intubate, superglottic airways are great. If you can get it placed and start oxygenating her and protect her airway and get her saturations up and be able to read end tidal CO2, awesome, big win, you did great. So there is no preference based on ET versus superglottic airway. If you can get a secure airway, please do. But if it comes between multiple attempts and oxygenation, please choose oxygenation. So establish IVs soon, early, preferably at the level above the diaphragm. So if she has her arms down to the side, if you need big IVs, you want them, ACs or higher is, you know, considered big IVs. 18 gauge or bigger is a big IV. But if she's going to be delivering a kid, if she's going to be pushing something out, if she's going to have her, if she's going to be in stirrups, you know, this is something to think about. If she's going to be having her arms bent at a 90 or 180 degree angle, trying to hold her legs up and out of the way, or she's pushing, she's going to include those AC IVs. Those big juicy 16 gauges will mean nothing if they're placed in the ACs and she has to bend her arms. So make sure that you take that into account the best you can. If you can't, and if that's the only thing you can get, then get it. But preferably start them high and big and out of her ACs. So identify and correct the cause of the arrest using H's and T's as appropriate. So with an arrest for uh, IV access, going back to that, in an arrest, she's not gonna be pushing anything real soon. What you want is a route for delivery of medication. IOs are great if you can start those humeral head IOs or if you can't get vascular access, if you can start an IO, awesome. There's no contraindication of pregnancy in an IO. Be able to throw them in and give her fluid and medications. Pain management in pregnancy. So this is a big thing that was never really asked for me and I had to do a lot of research for it. So what do we give people who are in pain who are pregnant? Like, well, can we give fentanyl? Can we give morphine? Can we give midazolam? And I kind of got lost in the forest looking at the trees, so to speak, in, oh, well, is it dangerous to the fetus? Is it not? What's the pregnancy category? This and that. So actually, fentanyl and morphine are category C. Use of this drug is not suggested unless the benefit outweighs the risk. So if you have a pregnant patient with bilateral femoral trauma, like she has bilateral femur fractures open, please give her pain medication. If she is traumatized and in pain, please give her pain medication. 
Please don't withhold comfort care and pain medication because you're too wrapped up in her pregnancy. She knows she's pregnant, you know she's pregnant, but she's also in pain. So midazolam is a category D. So I've got the categories down there and risk, uh, Category C is risk not excluded. Adequate studies lacking. So that means we just don't know. Chance of fetal harm, but benefits outweigh risks. So if she's really banged up and she's a meat puzzle, then please give her pain medication. And midazolam is a category D, meaning we have positive evidence of risk. Studies in humans show fetal risk benefit in pregnant women may outweigh risk. So if she's in status seizure and all you have is midazolam, Please give her midazolam because we're giving it to her so acutely that we're not going to cause that, tr that trouble that they're talking about in the pregnancy categories. What's worse, one dose of midazolam that really studies haven't shown one dose to be a big problem or having her seize nonstop. So the benefit versus risk, you're gonna to have to evaluate. And hey, the great thing is, being an EMS practitioner in Utah, we can call medical control. We can be like, hey, we got this, this, and this, and this is what's going on, this is what we wanna do, what do you think? So if you have doubts, then, I mean, I would say give the pain medication to be a good human being. But also, if you have doubts and you really can't answer one way or another, and you're sort of dancing in a gray area, call your medical control. Let's see what they think about it. And I, I bet more often than not, they would, be able, they would be okay with you giving pain control because it's in such a, an acute setting. All right, so we're gonna go through some things I like to do is the A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So A in pregnancy, trauma. So airway, SpO2 above 94%. Please do your best to get them above 94%. Have your suction ready, because remember our gastric emptying is slowed, almost 24 hours, we're gonna, con if she's eaten within 24 hours, we're gonna consider her having a full stomach. So please have your suction ready. Positioning, remember left positioning, and if you're doing airway, her sniffing position, she's got a bunch of laryngeoedema maybe, you know, there, there may be some big problems cooking with her body habitus, weight gain, swelling, so positioning will be super important. That, that neutral sniffing position with OPAs, NPAs, or whatever's going on, if you can get her good positioning, you're more likely to succeed with her airway. So BLS airways, obviously BLS before ALS. We aren't just gonna go to intubate right off the bat. Excuse me, ma'am, please be quiet. I'm going to put this tube in your throat, doesn't work. So we're obviously we're gonna go through BLS before ALS. If she saturates at 94% and above on a nasal cannula, awesome, big win. If you have to put her on a mask, great. 15 liters, up. if you have to bag her, okay. If you have to put in nasal adjuncts or oral adjuncts, go for it, big win. Just, just go BLS to ALS and manage aggressively. Don't be worried about, oh, well, I, uh, uh, maybe put them on oxygen. As much as needs to happen to make it successful. I want you, those of you who can uh, intubate, I want you to consider right off the bat that this is gonna be a difficult intubation and you need to cheat to win. Have bougies ready, have your emergency airways ready, have superglottics ready, have a partner ready to help you, be really pre-oxygenated, be in a great position. You know, set yourself up to win right from the beginning because this will be a hard intubation. And if it's easy, that means you did it right. So be prepared. Be prepared for extreme airway problems. Doesn't mean you'll always have to get out everything and be ready to innovate, but be ready to innovate in your mind. Be prepared with the next step. If this doesn't work, we're going to this. So B, breathing. Increased rate and decreased tidal volumes. So if you have the ability to put a manometer on, if you're doing BLS airway stuff, that would be great. If you can look at the airway pressures that you're pumping into her, that would be really, really good. But remember that she's gonna have an increased rate because of her pregnancy and also a decreased tidal volume. So you're not gonna be able to bag 1,200 milliliters of full adult bag into her. You're not gonna be able to do that to anyone. So remember that just until chest rise, just until chest rise, make it as easy as possible on yourself. So manage chest trauma normally. If she's got, if you suspect a hemothorax, pneumothorax, if you suspect, you know, any kind of flail segment, treat that as you would a not pregnant. That really doesn't affect us. What does affect is if she stops breathing and you didn't treat it because she was pregnant, 
then her and the, chi the child will possibly die. So circulation, assess for and control bleeding, maintain blood pressure, bilateral large bore IV access. Sound familiar? Yeah, that's familiar with every trauma patient we want to do all of that stuff with. However, I'm gonna add a caveat in there that circulation is the most often missed. She has a big blood fluid volume. She can lose a lot of blood before she starts to show many signs of hypotension, increased heart rate. So this is that you have to get on this early and be constantly evaluating blood pressure, pulse rate changes, respiratory rate changes. You wanna, you wanna get on big trauma fast because it can get away from you. And by the time it gets away from you in a pregnant gal, it could be too late. So really, really stay on top of circulation, breathing and airway, okay? So deformity and disability. So skeletal, uterine, fetal avulsion, GCS, neuro deficits, these are all things we, wanna, we want to evaluate for. If she's got broken bones, splint them. If she's got skeletal problems, splint them. If she's got a uterine tear or a uterine problem, uh, well, don't lay her flat on her back, 15 to 30 degrees, transport to the hospital for evaluation. If she's got exposed fetal parts or an avulsion, this is bad. If she says that the kid hasn't kicked in a while and that's really weird, that's bad. You know, these are things that you wanna ask her. So GCS, if she is decreased in her Glasgow coma score, obviously go to the hospital and assess for what's causing that. Could it be hypotension? Could it be anoxia? Could it be hypoxia? Whatever it is. Just make sure that you're assessing her GCS score. And if she has any neuro deficits, if she's got spinal trauma or neuro neurological trauma of any kind, that's despite the pregnancy, that's something that you'll need to assess for. So expose and exposure. So keep her warm. Remember trauma patients don't do well when they get cold. They have coagulopathies that start to come out and it can be really bad. So perform a rapid but detailed exam. This should be fast, she should be warm. So keeping her covered up is a good thing, but we also don't wanna miss trauma. So a, a naked patient, trauma patient is good. So if you have a trauma patient, they need to be as naked as you can get them to look at everything, okay? So fluids, have two warm NS or LR bags hanging and more ready. So it doesn't mean you need to use them. Doesn't mean you need to use LR over NS. In your trauma protocol, when you get that out, you look at what kind of fluid they want to use. Either crystalloid is fine, but have two ready to go and they need to be warm because obviously we want to keep her warm just like any trauma patient and not cool her down and cause about a, a bunch of problems down the road. And G is go, rapid transport. A lot of stuff with pregnancy we can't do anything about. Like 99.9% .9 of pregnancy problems we can't do anything about. Short of catching a kid, you know, if she has a precipitous delivery on scene, we really can't do much about it. We can just recognize the problem. So we are the, the recognizers. So transport quickly. Okay, this is one of the most important things about pregnancy also, is don't go down the rabbit hole. The very best incubator for the fetus is the mother. Treat the mother and in turn you will treat the child. Don't become obsessed with her pregnancy. It's a consideration for your treatment and should guide some different things and some different ideas for you, but it should not consume your focus. Remember that she may have trauma outside of the pregnancy. And if all you focus on is the pregnancy, then you'll miss other stuff, the broken arm, the head injury, the lacerations, the other gunshot wounds, the other stab wounds, the multiple stages of healing bruising. So make sure that you do a full body assessment on pregnant gals and the pregnancy is just a consideration. It shouldn't consume your focus. So common pitfalls. So these are the common pitfalls. These are common things that we get stuck with. I've kind of gone over some of these and we're gonna reiterate just a little bit, but not recognizing a pregnant patient. So I don't know how we could do this in most cases. I do know how we could do it in others, but we're, we, we won't go there. But leaving a trauma patient in the later stages of pregnancy in a supine position. So if you see a pregnant person supine and she's starting to have hypotension and they're opening up the IVs and they're starting to think about, oh no, she's bleeding from, just politely and uh, with your educator voice on, help them to position the patient properly and see if that fixes it. If it doesn't, then start going on other differential diagnoses. 
So failing to anticipate a difficult airway, this is big, medics. Medics don't get caught with a difficult airway in an ET tube in hand. Basics and intermediates are advanced. Don't get caught not positioning her well. Don't get caught letting her become hypoxic. Don't get caught because she has a difficult airway and we failed to recognize that. So be really, really careful about her airway and thusly the kid's airway because of that. So we control her airway, we control the oxygen supply to the kid and her. So, so failing to screen for domestic violence in patients presenting with injuries from assault. So by screen, I don't mean, hey, is this guy over here beating you up? No. Screen for is look at, do a trauma assessment. If she has stuff that looks like punch marks, if she has kick marks, if she has a boot print on her, like these are all good things to tell the hospital and the receiving physicians and nurses. So please just screen for it. This is more of an objective thing for us to look at when we're on scene. So missing the impending heated hemodynamic instability because of misinterpretation of vital signs. So remember that we will, adults will compensate, compensate, compensate when we're hurt. We will compensate and we compensate very well. Now a pregnant gal, she has the ability to vasoconstrict because she's already vasodilated. She has the ability to vasoconstrict much more than you and I do. Also, she has more volume than you and I do. So she's going to be down uh, in later stages of shock without showing you a lot. So I want you to be able to assess for that a lot, every five minutes if you have to, but don't get caught missing the impending hemodynamic instability. So, and the lastly, failing to monitor a patient for preterm labor or abruption of the placenta after minor abdominal trauma. Think about what would I do for my wife or girlfriend or what would I do for myself, if you're a female, if I got into a fender bender. Hey, 30 miles an hour parking lot, that's fast. But if she shows no signs of, of trauma, it's still a good idea for her to go check up with an OBGYN, get an ultrasound. If she has to go to the hospital in an ambulance, great. Just provide her access to healthcare to make sure her and her baby are safe. And that's our job is just do no harm and provide that, provide that gateway for her to get healthcare. So these are my sources. These are the studies I looked at. That's all I have for you guys today. Thank you very much for listening to the Grand Rounds and we'll take a couple of questions. Uh, one of our online viewers asked, um, it says, I understand the new policy is activation of the trauma too. If mom was in an accident in greater than 20 weeks, even if she has no real complaints, how should we treat them on the EMS side? So treat them as you normally would a trauma too. So if the hospital is activating a trauma two response, if you show up without IVs and if you show up without, there's a reason that the university activates a trauma two. So if, if it's through study based, if it's because of suspicion, I mean, it costs, it costs some money to activate a trauma team and they wouldn't do that lackadaisically. So if they're activating a trauma two, then you need to prepare the patient as if they were a trauma two. Now, use good judgment and if you're on the phone with the University of Utah and their ER and you say hey I'm coming in with a pregnant trauma patient and they say all right we're activating a trauma too okay what would you like me to do this is what I've got would you like anything else and let the and let the online medical direction help you with that or just standle your your standard local protocols will help out with that a lot so I hope that answers some of that question. Good. You actually nailed it perfectly from the trauma aspect of it. Good. Of what, of why we do that. All right. Just resources. Awesome. Okay. Any more questions? All right. Thank you very much. And that's all I have.